looking at where your party is strongest, traditionally you are, have strongholds in rural ridings, but this election, uh, many of the swing ridings are in urban areas with urban voters, and many of the issues driving this campaign are socially driven issues. So how do you expect to make traction in those ridings? It's a good point, and of course the resource-related issues are high on the list in rural ridings and not so much in the urban ridings. So we've been very much focused on uh, metro issues and you're right, uh, some of the economic issues are a bit hit and miss as to whether they affect everybody but our cutting of the PST was designed to be uniform for everybody across British Columbia. On the PST, when asked about you know, how you would pay for that to make up for it, you suggested there would be no cuts to education, to health care, and in fact you suggested there may not be uh, any cuts to government spending. That does not sound like a right of centre party. How do you reconcile that with being you know, the fiscally, uh, traditionally fiscally responsible party? Well, I think we're seeing all across the Western world that governments have come to the conclusion very quickly they have to support their populations. Interest rates are at all time lows, so this is the time to build infrastructure because it gets people employed and builds us into the future. We're in a kind of a wartime economy now. Where we've got to say government has to borrow and government has to invest because we've all got to stick together and pull each other up and get through this recession. So you're blowing an even bigger hole in the budget deficit than the NDP uh, with these money um, promises to voters. Will that not come as a surprise to hear the fiscally prudent party basically toss out the deficit and say that doesn't matter? I have not heard from a single voter and have not heard from a single party member who thinks this is a time for austerity. Austerity would ruin the lives of hundreds of thousands of people in this province who are dependent on federal payments. If those payments stopped tomorrow, we would have people milling around the streets without the money to buy groceries. We have got to support each other in this time of COVID and we'll make our way through it together. Aren't you concerned about what that would mean in the future for your government when it's time to start paying that back? Well, unless we get sufficient economic growth, it'll be very hard to pay it back. So what do we do to keep people engaged in our communities, to keep people having a sense of hope and purpose and plan for the future? We invest in economic growth. So you said austerity, this is not the time for austerity. Aren't you worried about how that might affect BC's credit rating? Well, I think when you see the United States government spending $3 trillion U.S. on direct supports to their citizens, they've sent every citizen in the U.S. $20,000 U.S., which is about $28,000 Canadian. In Canada, the number is about $11,000 Canadian that's been distributed to everybody in this country. When we talk about a $1,400 change, which is the per capita PST, I think that's a wise investment. I want to talk about Surrey policing. So a referendum on Surrey policing, would that be non-binding? Well, that has to be determined because obviously you've got to figure out exactly what the question is first, and you've got to figure out what the information is which will drive the question. Is it about extremely high cost? We don't know. Let's get some information out there, put together the question in a very public way, and then have a referendum based on the question. Because you have suggested it would be non-binding, in which case, how is this anything more than a political ploy to get votes right now? Well, the Referendum Act states right there in the top of Section 1 that it is uh, within the, the scope of the BC Cabinet to order an, a measure of expression of public opinion on an issue, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Are you not setting a dangerous precedent in blurring the lines between provincial and municipal jurisdiction, even from an optic standpoint? Well, that's why the Referendum Act has said for decades that the referendum can be confined to a certain geographic area. Why else would that uh, clause exist? That's why it's necessary for things that often involve cost issues. Let's talk about party values. There have still been calls, continuing calls through the campaign to remove Laurie Thronis as candidate. When was the last time you spoke to him directly about this? Well, I talk to all our candidates regularly. We have a all candidates call on Saturday mornings where I'm there to hear their concerns and deal with any issues that come up. So what line in the sand have you drawn with advertising with Laurie Thronis? Well, the advertising issue that came up was a particular publication. It was canvassed in the spring and the issue became clear at the same time the NDP were embarrassed by an article saying that adulterers and fornicators brought COVID to North America. So both parties have acted proactively to avoid that kind of advertising in inappropriate publications. So he's no longer advertising? 
As far as I'm aware, both parties have been effective in saying to their candidates, don't do the community advertising saying happy Thanksgiving in publications that put out inappropriate information. You're telling them not to, but is he still doing it? That's the directive, and I expect it to be followed. And what if it's not? There'd be consequences, obviously. Would he be removed as a candidate? Well, we're in the middle of an election now, and I've made it crystal clear to our candidates that there is no room for discrimination in British Columbia based on age, gender, sexual orientation, income, family of origin. All of that stuff is unacceptable in my party and in this election. It seems you're not willing to jeopardize a safe seat in the Fraser Valley at the expense of removing a candidate. What would it take for that to happen? Well, if a candidate is not subscribing to the party position that there is no room for any kind of discrimination in British Columbia, I would expect both the NDP and the Liberals to act accordingly. If you form government, I mean, what, what assurances can you give people that you won't just speak words and that they will be followed up by actions? Well, we see regular changes of um, staffing, whether it's in cabinet ministers, because the NDP found that their um, Minister for Citizen Services was in a dubious situation, had to go before a pro special prosecutor who eventually said that there was no basis for criminal charges against her. So these things happen in the normal course of government. There has been some criticism about your leadership style, that you're unrelatable. How are you going to connect with voters in the, the waning days of this campaign? It's always a challenge for opposition leaders to get known before the election. My job is to reach as many people as possible during this election with a positive agenda for British Columbia. So when people hear the name Andrew Wilkinson, what do you think they think? Well, I hope they think competent, credible, experienced, and a very safe person to steer the ship out of this pandemic and into an economic recovery. What is your personal brand and how are you going to change that to make it more relatable to British Columbians? My goal is to come across to people, just like I did as a family doctor, as someone calm, competent, and you're safe in the hands of the BC Liberals with me as the leader.